Hello and welcome to Crime Watch, where you can help cut crime. These are all detectives behind me and they're waiting for your call. Here's the number. We'll give you local numbers for the police throughout the country, so have a pencil handy. Remember, everything you see is fact. When we show you reconstructions, the detail is meticulous in the hope you just might spot a clue. We take you to the actual scene of the crimes and wherever possible, the people you see are the real witnesses. Now, if you think it's unlikely that you personally can help, well, experience tells us otherwise. Our first four programmes have led directly to a number of arrests and police are still working their way through dozens of new clues. Remember our reconstruction of the killing of the solicitor, Janice Weston, in a lay-by on the A1 last year? Over 150 people called with information, including a man who says he thinks he changed the wheel of Janice Weston's car at the lay-by on the A1 where she died. Police have asked us to appeal to him to call again in confidence. Here's the Crime Watch number, 01 811 or ring the incident room, that's Peterborough, 63232. 0733, the code for Peterborough, 63232. Remember this man? He's raided three building societies in Leeds and Sheffield. There were 40 calls from last month's Crime Watch, but the man is still on the loose and apparently still at it. Police have linked him with three new crimes. Four weeks ago, at noon, he terrorised building society staff at Denton near Manchester. An hour later, he did the same at Glossop in Derbyshire. And two weeks later, he was at Salford. Here he is again. This is still the best picture we have. If you know him, please do ring us. He may fire that gun one day unless he's caught. And back in June, you may remember the Aladdin's Cave of Stolen Goods from Devon and Cornwall. Well, not only have some of the items been identified, but two people have been charged with a series of burglaries and committed for trial at Exeter Crown Court. There's another treasure trove of stolen goods for you to see tonight. We start tonight with one of the most elaborate of crimes. It must have involved months of research and setting up, but it was over in about three minutes. The crooks are clearly dangerous, but they've profited to the tune of half a million pounds. We can show you exactly how it was done, because steps have now been taken to stop it happening again. Now, watch closely. If you can help solve this one, you could make yourself a fortune. There's a reward of almost £50,000. The story begins in Chelmsford, in Essex. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our combined plant and commercial auction here on October the 1st. The story begins on the first day of last month in Essex at one of the busiest car and lorry auctions in the south of England. It was here that someone made what should have been a discreet transaction, but it didn't go unnoticed. 7-9 bid at 7. 7.25 against 7.50. 7.75 at 7.75 for the first. Second, third at 7.75. Can you sign with the young lady, please? The man who bought that yellow lorry stood out at the auction. He had black, greased back hair, he spoke with a West Midlands accent, and he wore a tie. Somehow he seemed too smartly dressed for the occasion. He was probably with two other men. The lorry they'd bought had nearly 200 miles to cover before it reached its final destination. It's 8.30 a.m. the next day, Tuesday, October the 2nd and two men joined this blue Bedford van filling up at a petrol station at Market Drayton in Shropshire. One of the men was particularly distinctive, heavily built, five foot ten inches tall, with long, dark hair and a striking Mexican-style moustache. One witness also remembers the driver of the blue van. He was stockily built in his late 30s and he had light brown hair which looked as though it was receding at the sides. He also wore a gold ring on his right hand. Thanks a lot, love. The blue van had been stolen from Leeds in June. Just after 10 a.m. that same day, on an industrial estate in Telford, a van driver noticed a stranger in the lorry park. He was picking up this distinctive purple and white tipper truck. It had been parked there for a week. This lorry had been bought 12 days earlier at another auction in Meesham in Leicestershire. It had an appointment to keep in just over two hours' time. 
and it set off into the heart of Shropshire along the A442 Whitchurch Road. It's later that same day, Tuesday, October the 2nd. It was lunchtime when this Group 4 armoured security van left the Shropshire town of Wem, travelling east to make another delivery. The journey took it over Western Crossroads on the A49. That's the main trunk road from Shrewsbury to Warrington. And that was where it passed a distinctive purple and white lorry. What's he up to? He ain't gonna stop. Get him back, get him back. There's another one behind us. those few terrifying minutes, they disappeared with £454,000 in virtually untraceable banknotes. Now, just to recap, the yellow lorry came from Chelmsford and was driven 200 miles to the ambush point near the A49. That's not far from the Shropshire market town of Wem. The next day, Tuesday, October the 2nd, the gang closed in. At Market Drayton, the blue getaway van was seen filling up. And at Telford, the distinctive purple lorry was driven away. At 12.15 that day, the Group 4 van set off from Wem, crossed the A49, and this is where it finished up. Detective Superintendent Barry Main, let me make the point first of all. We obviously consulted you and Group 4 in some detail before showing that. This sort of crime would now be hard to replicate. Certain steps have been taken to avoid a recurrence, yes. Right, now, the lorries are obviously the best clues you have to go on. What, what information do you need? Well, the yellow lorry, we believe, was driven up from the auction in Charlesford into Shropshire on the 1st of October. It had a me uh, mechanical fault. Uh, it was losing oil and water, so it was necessary to stop fairly frequently. So it was somebody... dropping oil and would have called in a station... Yes, somebody station, must probably. have seen that vehicle. OK, fine. And the blue getaway van, that had been stolen in Leeds? That was stolen in Leeds on the 26th of June, and it must have been stored between that time and the 2nd of October. So where was it? Right. Now, what about the men? We've got some not bad descriptions. We've got the man who was at Chelmsford in the, uh, in the auction. Now, we've got a fairly good description. That's the video fit you've got of him there. Yes. Now, he's described as in his 30s. He's five foot six. He's clean shaven. And as you see, his hair is, is greased and combed back. Now, we've done a video fit here. He was described as having a sallow complexion. What was meant by that? Witnesses describe uh, him as looking ill. As ill, right. Yes. Now, that slicked back hair, obviously, if you were going to disguise yourself, maybe one of the first things you do is cream back your hair. Well, I'd, I'd have difficulty doing that, but, uh, yes, it's possibly <laughs> a disguise. OK. Now, the other guy, he was um, with this extraordinary moustache. Again, that presumably could have been a false moustache. That's possible, yes. Uh, again, with the video fit, we can, we can take that off. This guy's stockily built, and that's the best description we've got of him. That's what he'd look like without the moustache. Yes. The reward... It's enormous. Yes, it is. Up to £45,000 for any information concerning the robbery. Tax-free, I presume? I presume so, yes. Now, if people are frightened about ringing in, can they ring anonymously? Can they ring in confidence? Yes, we'd like to hear from anyone who has information. Uh, of course, if they want the reward, then we will require some detail. Obviously, it, you're going to have to have an address and a name for them if they want to get something of a reward. The number yes. to call, if you can help, here it is, 01811 8055. If you prefer, you can call the incident room at WEM Police Station. That's WEM 34100, 0939 34100.
And now tonight's Aladdin's Cave. We have a treasure trove here of property that's been recovered by police and maybe something belongs to you. This month's collection has come from Gloucestershire's police and together with some silver from Hertfordshire. But since police believe all of it to be stolen property, it could have come from anywhere in Britain. We'll show you as many of the items as we can and here's John Bly of the Antiques Roadshow to pick out some of the more unusual ones. Well, once again, we've got an extraordinary mixture of objects. Here, for example, look at these lovely little pen knives, all collected with great love and care, each one separate and different. You know, somebody's bound to miss that little collection. They're also probably going to miss this collection of mugs. Very popular, coronation and jubilee mugs. Again, they'd leave quite a space on someone's shelf. Now, as usual, we've got a large representation from the East. From Japan, we've got two very fine coffee services. This one, particularly wonderful quality from Satsuma. Over here we've got also from Japan two figures of Butai, the god of happiness. This one's been made into a lamp but he still looks fairly cheerful about it. And from China, from Canton to be precise, we've got a tea service. Now Canton, although it means the place of origin, it also describes the type of decoration. This gold, multicoloured enamel on top interspersed with very busy panels. An important little service from about 1890 from China up to the Mediterranean, and our only piece of furniture this time. But it's distinctive. It's a Savonarola, and it's walnut, and it's inlaid with ivory. So that really ought to stand out in someone's collection. But what I really want to talk to you about is this, this group of cloisonne ware. Now, cloisonne is quite valuable. It's a late development in decoration. Cloison is the name of the little wire that intersperses the colour, the decoration itself. Sounds like a French breakfast, but it's not. Cloisonne is the type of where it is. Now, this is quite valuable today. Uh, it would date from about 1890, and if perfect, that vase would be, oh gosh, between 500 and 600 pounds, but it's not. It's damaged just on the shoulder. Perhaps that man might jog someone's memory. Now to some silver. We've got here a pair of fish servers in a case, uh, but I wonder how many people know what those are. Well, those actually are a pair of Victorian asparagus servers. They're no means rare, but they're not common either. Now, from my own home county of Hertfordshire, I've been asked to just show you this collection of silver and plate. This lot is worth over £10,000. But what I really want to talk about is this wine ewer. This a typical piece of fine quality 1860 silverware, made in 1859, in fact, by George Angel, was made for Dr Morris Day from Worcester, and it bears the inscription on it to that effect. So it's unique, and let's hope it will jog someone's memory. Remember, all of these things have been stolen from anywhere, so if you recognise something, call us on Crime Watch UK. The number to call if you do recognise anything, 01 811 8055. Three weeks ago, near Bristol, a body was discovered. The victim was a woman, a mother of two, and she'd been missing from home since early June. Shelley Morgan was an American by birth, but had married and lived here in Britain for 12 years. She and the children had only recently moved to Bedminster, a suburb of Bristol. Her husband planned to join them when he'd finished renovating their family home in Wales in order to sell it. Shelley was an artist and things had been going very well for her. She'd had a commission from an art dealer to paint these views of Bristol, and she had one left to finish, a view of the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Our reconstruction begins at Shelley's home on the day that she went missing, the morning of Monday the 11th of June. That's it. Thank you. That's it, darling. Are you ready? Good. I'm nearly ready. I'm just going to do a bit of packing. What are you taking that for, Mum? My camera? Well... You know that bridge I showed you the other day, that pretty one near Clifton? Oh, yeah, that big one. Well, that's yeah. the last of my sketches. Oh. And if I take some photographs, then I can paint and draw at all the angles that I want. Oh. OK? Come on. Oh, oh good morning. <laughs> good morning. Come on, darling. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Morning, Mrs. Morgan. 
again, according to city code. A couple of hours after seeing her children off to school, sometime between 10 and 11 a.m., Shelley Morgan called into the sorting office in Kent Street to collect a registered letter. I've got a banker's card. The letter contained money from her husband, which he sent every week while he was away working on their house in Wales. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Where Shelley went next has not been fully established. However, a witness travelling on this bus thinks she saw someone closely resembling Shelley get on at about 10 past 10 that morning. She remembered the woman because of her long fair hair and her distinctive red glasses. If indeed it was Shelley Morgan, that bus would have taken her to the centre of Bristol and the bus station. Police would like to hear from anyone who may have spotted Shelley after 11 o'clock that morning. If she did plan to photograph the Clifton Suspension Bridge, she could have got a bus from here. When the children came home from school, their mother wasn't there. The house was locked and empty. Finally, a neighbour took them into her house to wait for her. As time went on, it became increasingly clear that something was very wrong. At 7.30pm that Monday, the 11th of June, Shelley Morgan was officially registered as a missing person. Months went by, birthdays passed, and still no word from Shelley. Fears were becoming expectations. Then on Monday, the 24th of September, police headquarters in Bristol received this dramatic phone call. I got some very important information about the missing woman from Windmill Hill. Unfortunately, this is going to turn out to be a murder inquiry. The body is in a Wall Street grave. I'm not certain whereabouts to. It's in, a, uh, it's in Hannam River between the bottom of Conham Hill and the old sea Police had to take this call seriously. Immediately, they launched an underwater search team to look for the body. After 19 days, their intensive search revealed nothing. Tell me when you're ready to leave bottom over. The call about the stretch of river at Hannam had been a hoax. Then just two days later, police were speeding west, west of the suspension bridge where Shelley had intended to take photographs, and west of Bristol to Backwell, just eight miles from where Shelley lived. Their destination was Long Lane in Backwell, Avon. The missing person inquiry had become a murder investigation. On Sunday the 14th of October, three small children found a badly decomposed body. It was Shelley Morgan. Missing from the scene were her clothing, glasses and bag containing her camera, sketchbooks and the registered letter from her husband. The body was found not in a watery grave, but at Watercatch Farm. A full-scale police investigation to find her killer has now begun. Shelley Morgan's father speaks for the first time about his daughter's death. Well, the biggest irony of this whole thing is that for 12 years, during which time Shelley was here, we never worried about her physical safety. We knew that she was here in a very highly civilized, decent country, surrounded by people of goodwill and honesty, and uh, 
generally well-ordered uh, community. And we, we simply did not have to worry about uh, our daughter. Of course, now uh, this is all gone. She's, uh, we can't bring her back, but we can, I think, uh, consider those who are still here. Uh, we feel that this, this person is a, a, an extreme menace to uh, uh, just about anyone. And we hope that uh, anyone who might someday or somehow know something about this person, that they will be able to come forward to the police and convey this information to them. Well, Detective Superintendent, the anonymous caller who called you had a local accent. Do you think he would have had anything to do with Shelley's death, in fact? Well, we won't know until we trace him. I wouldn't have thought so. Um, but it is very strange that he phones us three months after her disappearance. Why? Why was he phoning us at that time? Is there some little piece of information that he's got that he wanted us to be interested in? We won't know until we find him. If it is a hoax and he comes forward, will you prosecute him? Of course not. We're dealing with a murder inquiry. All we want to do is arrive at the truth, and that's it. So if he is watching, please contact us and we'll resolve it and find out what it was all about. Now, you're sure that she was killed on the actual day she disappeared, on June the 11th. What was the motive for her murder, do you believe? Well, it has all the appearance of sex. She was naked apart from her shoes and a pair of tights, face down in a copse. Her clothing's gone somewhere. Uh, we're still carrying out certain tests, but um, there is little doubt that it must have been a sexual attack and then a murder. So what exactly do you need the public's help with? The clothing's missing, as you say. Do you think somebody might have found that? Anything and everything, anything that anybody knows about her movements. Perhaps the man responsible is already in prison and has talked to somebody. Anybody who's got a lodger they're worried about, a woman who's had a bad experience in a car, somebody trying to pick her up in a car. That's the one thing we are certain of. She must have been taken there in a car, and at that time she was either alive or she was dead. Um, that bag is very distinctive, isn't it? That might provide a clue. It is. That bag was made from a blueprint that her mother supplied from materials that we found at her home, very similar to the one she had. As you've already said, her dress is missing, her red spectacles are missing, the registered envelope is missing. All those items are somewhere. Her clothing is somewhere. And the most vital clue of all, of course, is the camera. This is, and this is the most vital clue that we have got, as you said. This is an identical camera. It's an Olympus, as you see. It's an OM-20 camera. And I do appeal to anybody watching tonight, please give us two minutes of your time, because there's only one camera in the world that's got the number 103-2853 on it. It's stamped there on the metal at the bottom here. That camera was stolen from her. Please take time after the programme to look. If you've acquired a camera like that since the 11th of June, please check it. And any dealer that's watching, will you please take a note of that number and check your stock in the morning? Detective Superintendent, thank you very much indeed. The number to ring is 01811 or you can call the incident room in Bristol, which is Nailsy H54011, 0272 And if you live in Bristol, you can ask the operator for free phone Nailsy Incident Room. Now the Crime Watch incident desk, where we invite the police to appeal to you directly. Tonight, we start with a major new request for help in the investigation into the bomb attack at Brighton. Here are Chief Inspector David Hatcher and Detective Constable Helen Phelps. The Brighton bomb inquiry depends on eliminating everyone who stayed at the Grand Hotel since July the 1st. But that's been made more difficult because, for whatever reason, many people registered under false names. Sussex police have asked Crime Watch to make a special appeal for one man who booked in using the name Roy Walsh. On September the 15th, 16th and 17th, just three and a half weeks before the bombing, he stayed in room 629, the room where the bomb was planted. Detective Chief Superintendent Jack Rees, who's heading the inquiry, has joined us here in the Crime Watch studio. And if the man who gave his name as Roy Walsh rings, now Mr Rees guarantees that his call will be treated in absolute confidence. He also wants to hear from Mr. Walsh's companion that weekend, the 15th to the 17th of September, and anyone else who thinks they may know who Roy Walsh is. 
And your help is urgently needed in tracking down a man who raped an unemployed girl three weeks ago on Tuesday, October the 16th. The well-spoken middle-aged city gent first approached the 18-year-old girl on Monday the 15th of October as she left the job centre in Erdington in Birmingham. Smartly dressed in a blue-grey suit and calling himself Mr Day, he invited the girl to come for an interview for a job as a receptionist. But his calculated plan had started a week earlier when he gained the keys and access to an empty shop at 38 Marsh Lane, Erdington. He then placed advertisements, this is one of them, in various local news agents. The number for applicants to call was this phone box on the corner of Membury Road and Washwood Heath Road. Did you see a man hanging around this box between the 10th and the 16th of October? On Tuesday the 16th, the girl he had met at the job centre kept her appointment at the Marsh Lane shop where she was assaulted. The man we're looking for is 45 to 50 years old, 5 foot 10 inches tall, well built and of smart appearance. There's evidence that he may have been driving a white X-registered metro and he claims to come from outside the area. If you know anyone who fits this description and was in Birmingham between the 10th and the 16th of October, please ring us. At 3.15pm on the 3rd of October, a Securicor Corps van arrived at Norman's Cash and Carry in Christchurch, Dorset, to make a routine collection. The van was attacked, and as this police reconstruction shows, the driver was shot in the leg. The vital clue which you can help with are these overalls, which were dropped at the scene during the attack. Just here, on the inside of the pocket, there is a name. It's hard to make out the writing now, but by close examination, you can see that the name is B. Gregory. B. Gregory may know nothing about the armed attack, but he or she may well be able to put police on the trail of the armed robbers. Let us know if you have any idea who B. Gregory might be. Next on Incident Desk, we have four faces we want you to take a close look at. Among the Crime Watch photo call faces this month are these two. The robbery squad have asked us to appeal to anyone who may have seen these two men. On the left is Christopher Haig, and on the right, Stefan Raczynski. Both of these men escaped from Harrow Police Station on Wednesday the 3rd of October, where they were waiting to appear in court on charges connected with an armed robbery. Both men may be armed and should certainly not be approached. If you think you've seen them, you can ring us in confidence here on Crime Watch UK. And have you seen this man? His name's John Goldie, and police believe he may be able to help them with their inquiries into the theft of £52,000 from a Securicor van in Coventry on the 7th of June this year. He speaks with a Scottish accent and has a tattoo, Scotland Forever, on the left forearm, and Gloria on his right hand. Incidentally, he was last spotted at Annick in Northumberland on the 4th of July this year. And the third picture we want you to study was taken at the Baker Street branch of the Newcastle Building Society in London's West End. At 3.45pm on Wednesday the 22nd of August, this man threatened staff with a handgun, demanded cash and then walked out with the gun and the cash in his plastic bag. If we zoom right in on our enlarged print, we get such a good look at the robber's face that someone must surely recognise him despite his dark glasses. Ring us here if you recognise him. Someday he may use his gun. He's about 5 foot 8 inches tall and has sandy hair. And call us if you recognise any of the faces in our photo call. And if you have any information on any of those cases, call us here on 01811 8055. 01811 8055. Our next and our last reconstruction tonight is a crime that police already know is going to be a very hard one to crack. It seems to have been a professional killing, a cold-blooded execution almost. Now, you may not know who did it, but you might know of a motive or have a clue. The victim was Lloyd Simpson. A Londoner, and if you're an East Ender, you might have seen him walking Yank, his American pit bull terrier, in Victoria Park in Hackney. It's Guy Fawkes night a year ago. Lloyd was watching television. Outside, there was a fireworks party, a noisy one. This film might prick someone's conscience. In fact, Lloyd's father is so anxious and determined to have the killers caught that he's decided to relive what happened with an actor playing the part of his son. Sex for me. Colour in there and white in there. I'm a waste paper dealer. I collect waste paper, cardboard, and I do transport. So 
So Lloyd worked for me. Just got made to make a phone call. Lloyd was with me uh, Friday afternoon, and um, I um, asked him if he'd take the car home on the night time. So he said, "Yeah, okay, I will." Said all that. See you later. When I arrived at the pub, he was sitting at the bar, drinking his little half a pint, as he always has, and his cigar. But he never seemed worried, never seemed anything like that. He seemed happy enough. On the Saturday, what he'd done, he brought the car back, then, he, then he's locked the car up, and then he's took the dog and gone his usual way. That's gone over the flyover, right, into Victoria Park and gone down towards home. Oh, easy. Easy, boy, easy. Long way to go yet, mate. Come on. Come on. Yank. Come on. Yank, back for it. Come on. Get your legs. Nice. Yes. Go on. Who's that? Go on. Go on. See if you can get him. Go on. Go on. He can do better than that. Go on. Yane is a, is, a, is a wonderful dog. Uh, he's an American pit bull terrier. They're a nice, friendly dog, providing you keep them away from other dogs. They seem to want to fight other dogs. All right, mate, I can't stop. I'll see you later on, all right? They are valuable dogs. I would say they're, they're, they're at five, six hundred pounds. They're supposed to be brought into this country for uh, fighting. But uh, I don't know of any what do fight, and I know the Yankees never fight because Shanks only eleven. He was only eleven months old. Now, as he goes down the canal, this is where he's met Chrissy Roberts before he's gone home, and that's all I can tell you about that part of it. What, mate? Yeah, he Hello, Chris. All right, Yank. Yeah, he's doing all right. Yeah, he looks good. Like new harness. Yeah, lovely. Where you get that? I bought it today, just down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Handsome. I'll tell you what, I've got his old one indoors. You can have that if you want. Yeah? Yeah. Me. I'll tell you what, I'll drop it off a bit later on. Lovely. Fine, where you been? I'll just stop the motor off down the old man's. Yeah? Yeah. As it goes, I'd better get him home, get him some dinner, like. Yeah, look right? hungry. I'll see you later, all right? Good luck, you. mate. Chrissy was the last one to see him alive. That was about half one. Then he went home. Whether he went straight home, that I wouldn't know. Come on, you. Up. Come on, you. Give it time. Give it time, boy. Oh, you are, but oh, you are, but 
get it. <laughs> the rumble tombs you've seen them on telly. A sort of either. As far as we know, he laid there from the, from the Saturday to the Sunday and from the Sunday to the Monday. Because it wasn't until I went in the flat and I found him. I went through the door and then I shout out, Lloyd, Lloyd, where are you? Lloyd. And then I got no reply. You know, when you think that the walls are so thin, and our people don't hear anything with a, like a shotgun going off. It's hard to believe that no one couldn't hear anything. I can't accept that no one don't know about it because someone out there must know about this. And I know if someone do know, but they're as bad as them who killed him. Bill Peters, why was he killed? What was the motive? If I knew why Lloyd Simpson was killed, I'm convinced I would be very close to finding those responsible. Quite clearly, he was killed for something that he had in his possession. Um, I think it may be drugs or something like, like that, because his premises had been searched very thoroughly and in what appears to be a frenzied way. Uh, and those are responsible uh, probably find what they were looking for. But it must have been something very important for them to kill Lloyd Simpson for. He wasn't expecting anyone, was he? He certainly wasn't. Uh, all indications are that he was sitting watching television quite comfortably with his shoes off, watching Saturday afternoon television. So he hadn't made an appointment. I mean, could they have known that uh, he was going to be there? Might he have met them that afternoon? I don't think so. Uh, they could see him from the veranda by looking straight through the kitchen window. They could see him sitting there, clearly through the, the beaded curtain, and uh, the, they then kicked the door in and shot him. Now, apart from the neighbour, no one saw him, no one heard him. That seems to be the case. Unless, of course, people were, were frightened to tell you about it. Yes, this may well be so. Uh, if anyone is too frightened to come forward and to, to give me their, their name and address, they can do so, obviously, anonymously, in, or in complete confidentiality. And, of course, they can talk to a civilian if they're too frightened to talk to, a, to a police officer. So the motive is really the key thing. You need to find out why he died, and then you'll know who killed him. Yes, that would be a big step forward. Quite clearly, those responsible were very calculating. They chose the night very carefully. Uh, because of the fireworks going off at the time, and they were, they were thoroughly ruthless. And I would just like to add my words to those of his father and say that if any of you know why Lloyd Simpson was killed, whatever he had in his possession, uh, please contact us as soon as possible. All right, Bill Peters, thanks very much. You can call us here at Crime Watch on 01 811 8055, or you can ring the City Road Police direct at City Road on 488 5271. That's 488 5271. And all the numbers are on CFAX on page 185 for the rest of the week. If you don't have a phone or can't get through, drop us a line. All letters will be treated in confidence. Here's the address Crime Watch UK, BBC TV, London W12 8QT. The main number is easy to remember, and we're here all evening, remember. Please ring if you think you can help in any way. In fact, as always, we'll be back to tell you what develops in an hour from now. That's Crime Watch UK update here on BBC One at five past eleven. In fact, I've just been told we've had 30 calls so far on the battering ram attack on the Group 4 security wagon with lots of new information. And we've had several calls on the Brighton bomb too. Uh, one man uh, has called who may be of particular interest. Uh, we're still looking for Mr Roy Walsh or whoever it was who booked into the hotel under that name. And if you did so, please do call us, 01811 8055. We'll be back with more update, as, as uh, Sue was saying, at 11.05, if you can't stay up till then. Do please believe us as we leave you with what's become something of a familiar reassurance on Crime Watch. Even though it doesn't seem like it at times, Britain is still one of the safest countries on Earth, and the sort of crimes that we've asked your help with really are extremely rare. In fact, from the sort of response that we've already had, it's just possible that after all your calls tonight will be just a tiny bit safer still. So please, don't have nightmares. Good night. Good night.